Greetings in the name of Christ. It's good to see all of you here on this beautiful summer morning in February. I want to welcome all of you to First Baptist Church today, uh, especially if you are a guest. If you are a guest with us today, that we hope that you find this a place of worship and we hope that you experience God in this place in a mighty way. Would like to ask that all who are present, if you could add your name to the friendship register, uh, you will find those on the end of each pew. Uh, just add your name and then pass it on to the next person. Guests, in addition to your names, uh, if you are comfortable sharing your information, we do invite you to share with us a phone number or an email address, uh, or maybe a home address. That way we can follow up with you uh, after the service. But again, we do welcome you here with us this morning. A few announcements that I'd like to call to your attention. Uh, many of you are aware that tonight um, at White Bull United Methodist Church at 6.30 p.m. is the Carolyn T. High Missions Conference. Uh, that should be a, a wonderful time. I hope that you all can join us for that. Our choir will be singing there, uh, a combined choir, and it should be a wonderful experience. So I hope you all will join us at 6.30 tonight for that. Uh, also, please find the insert in your bulletin. It looks like this. Um, we are collecting information that way we can contact people um, if, and if there's a, a funeral during the week or if we have uh, maybe some kind of a weather cancellation or anything, we can get the word out to you all fast. So if you could fill that out and then maybe um, put it in the offering plate or bring it by the office this week, we would really greatly appreciate having that information so we can include you in those that we contact for that. Um, also want to give a... Um, just a, a report, we had the uh, event scheduled for yesterday that was the Reaching People Under 30 While Keeping People Over 60. That was to be led by Eddie Hammett, uh, but Eddie Hammett had come down with the flu. So we had moved that to uh, April 7th, which means that registration, we're going to open that back up for those who could not make the, this past Saturday. But we are going to um, allow those who, who cannot make the April 7th date but signed up for yesterday to get their money back. So make sure that you let us know if you'd like to get your money back and make sure that you go register if you do plan on attending for April 7th. But I am going to also ask that you keep Eddie in your prayers. Uh, I checked in with him yesterday to see how he was feeling because it was Wednesday that we, we found out he had come down with the flu. And by Saturday, he was in the hospital with some heart complications and uh, some breathing issues due to the flu. So if you will just keep Eddie Hammett in your prayers as he is dealing with that. Um, good man, and we, we'd hope to get him back to, to full health. So keep him in your prayers. Um, would also like to direct your attention to the back of the bulletin for our weekly schedule. Uh, some opportunities for you to plug in with things that we have going on throughout the week. But every, mo every Sunday morning, we open our worship with a moment of silence. And this is our opportunity to remember why it is that we're here and to reflect and call our attention upon our holy and loving God. So if you will, join me in a moment of silence. Amen.
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Holy and loving Father, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us this morning. Lord, we are very aware that there is an ideal that you call us to. His name is Jesus Christ. Lord, we are also aware that we cannot live up to that ideal, that we will always fall short. Lord, forgive us. Help us to come this morning with humility. Lord, we approach our worship this morning knowing that you are a great God who loves us. We are grateful for this life. We are grateful for this place that we can gather today to worship you. It is in Jesus Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. of reading found printed in your bulletins. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn. 
saying that he has done it. Our scripture reading this morning is from Genesis 17, 1 through 7, and 15 and 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you, and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings, co kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. The God of Abraham praise is number 34 in your hymnal. The choir will sing stanza one, and we ask that you sing stanzas two or three with us. through 25. 
It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words, it was credited to him, were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. The offertory hymn is 494, Take Up Your Cross. It actually goes well with the gospel reading that we will hear later in our service. Would you stand as we sing together? Take up thy cross, the Savior said. to you this morning with humble and grateful hearts. We have so much to be thankful for. Our country, our families, our church, and especially for your love for us and your provisions. 
We thank you for the opportunity to serve you in this church. We serve by our personal service to others, and we serve you by giving back to you the monetary gifts that you have so blessed us with. Lord, we pray that our gifts to you will be used to further your kingdom at home and abroad, that souls will be saved, hardships lightened, and people fed. Help us not to take your love and blessings for granted and be willing to give of our time and talents in your name. In Jesus' precious name I pray. I do. It's a brand, it's a brand new, uh-oh, I picked up the wrong, I picked up the wrong deck of cards today, but here, I'm going to do this right here. I want you to, I'm going to do a magic trick. You ready? Pick a card. Just one card, okay. Now, you see what your card says? Can you see it? Okay. Now, stick it back here in the deck. Okay? Now, I'll move these around. Let's see. I think... Is that your card? 
No. Well, see, I didn't open up my deck of cards today. Just to show y'all, I didn't open I opened the wrong deck of cards today, so my, my game is all out. But you know what a magician does? The magician made a mistake this morning, but with a magician, he takes those cards and he shuffles them around, and, but he's got to have a real deck of cards. See, I didn't do my homework like I was supposed to this morning. But what happens is he takes that card and he knows where it is and he goes, snap, and then he shows you that card and it's your card because he spent a lot of time doing that work and figuring out how to do that magic trick. Well, today... In our scripture passage, Jesus was talking to his disciples. And you know what he said? He said, guys, he said, one day, so before long, they're going to take me, they're going to beat me, they're going to take me to court, they're going to hang me on a cross, and I'm going to die. But in three days, I will rise again. And Peter was there, and he pulled, he pulled Jesus aside. He said, Jesus, come here, come here, listen. You can't talk like that man you can't talk like this you know you are the messiah you can do anything you can snap your fingers right now and take over the whole world and jesus said get behind me satan get behind me you're you're wanting to do things the way man does things i'm here to do what god has given me the authority and what he's told me to do so you see jesus could have looked at all those people that day when he was on the cross. He could have snapped his fingers just like that magician did. And he could have taken over the whole world. And could have made the world a much better place. But Jesus decided to do what God sent him here to do. And so boys and girls, we all are called by God to follow him. Sometimes it's not easy. But we have a reward one day in heaven that will be the most wonderful thing that we could ever hope for would be to spend forever in heaven with Jesus. Pray with me. Dear Jesus, we thank you for today. We thank you for following God and doing the things that he sent you here to do. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Note to self, always check when you think you have a brand new deck of cards. Always check and make sure there really are the right thing in the, uh, in the, in the packet. I played a magic trick on you today. <laughs> I think they must have. <laughs> Come on, guys. Will you all join me in a word of prayer? source of life and love, loving creator, holy God, we look to you not only as our great example, but also as our constant companion. When we cannot see beyond the mundane, when our future looks bleak, and in those moments when we find ourselves paralyzed by situations that are life depleting, you remind us of your preferred future for our lives, a future with a hope, abundant life, eternal life. God, when we feel lonely, when our human interactions produce pain, and when we find ourselves at our most unlovable, you remind us that we are your children and the recipients of your unconditional love and perpetual presence. As your beloved, we yearn to be a loving people, a people who are known by our love of God and our love of neighbor. As such, we come alongside those that we know to be in need. This day we pray for those in our congregation who are hurting and in need of your love. Those in our community, those who we know and love, who need your touch. God, we grieve with those who grieve. 
especially those who have recently experienced loss. We seek healing and wholeness, God, in our relationships and in our world. And we pray for those who have had their lives interrupted by severe weather, for those tasked with meeting the incredible needs that such storms create, and for those striving to ensure that our planet has a healthy future. We pray for those who are unemployed and for those who are underemployed. We pray for those who worship their work and for those who labor tirelessly for more just economic structures. Lord, we seek to be a united and even a uniting church. We pray for the spirit of collaboration and that it triumphs over the lore of competition whenever and wherever people of faith interact with one another. As those, those who seek to be faithful in the present, to be your committed and competent co-creators, we offer these our prayers in your holy name. Amen.
scripture reading today comes from the Gospel of Mark. We will be in chapter 8, reading verses 27 through 38. If you'd like to follow along, I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of God for the people of God. What a beautiful passage we just read. How fitting it is that in the week that Billy Graham went on to be with our Lord in heaven, that the lectionary text is about not being ashamed of Jesus and his words. Billy Graham, as we all know, was a preacher who spoke with boldness about how Jesus had changed his life. And he invited all that he meant to know his Lord and Savior. Because of his preaching, it is estimated that some 3.2 million have responded to the invitation to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior. 3.2 million people. I doubt that any person alive could accuse Billy Graham of ever being ashamed of Jesus and his words. I think we could, without a doubt, say that his faith in Jesus Christ was genuine, and as a result, today he is experiencing the rewards of a life well lived. He preached with vigor. He knew who Jesus was, and as a result, he knew who he was. He knew exactly what he was called by God to do, and he never held back. Jesus says, those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Now, the opposite of shame is pride. Therefore, we must be proud of our Lord and our relationship with the Lord. Now, I know a lot of us have grown up with an understanding that pride is a sin, but not the kind of pride that we're talking about here. Now, pride that is focused on personal accomplishments that feed the ego, they fail to recognize that it is God who we should be giving the glory to. 
But being proud of Jesus and who he is and who he teaches us to be is a true form of worship that continuously calls our attention upon the glory of God. When we are proud of Jesus, free of egotistical motivations, we are compelled to pick up a cross and follow a path that is not our own. See, that's the kind of pride that gives us confidence in our mission, the mission of Jesus Christ. Now, I think we ought to address something that is what I believe a false understanding of this passage. You see, I've seen some people use this passage as a reason to shove their bad theology in the face of others, and then they claim that they are proclaiming the message of Jesus without shame. So perhaps we ought to have some humility with our approach. So we don't find in Jesus' words an excuse to flaunt our half-worked-out faith. See, being proud of Jesus means that you've done some soul-searching yourself, that you've done some searching of the Bible and have developed a well-formulated understanding of who Jesus is, not because some pastor has told you who he is, but because you know deep in your heart of hearts that Jesus is your Savior. That Jesus is the one who has made your life whole and has given you great insight into sacrificial love. That's the kind of pride that is infectious. That's the kind of confidence and self-awareness that makes people want to say, Tell me about your God. When we're proud of our relationship with Christ, we won't have to be in people's faces about our faith because that kind of love seeps from our pores. But the truth remains that we could very easily be confidently wrong about who our Lord is. We see that in this passage, don't we? When Simon Peter confidently took Jesus aside to rebuke him. He was rebuking Jesus because Jesus was teaching that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. That doesn't look like a lot of glory. It doesn't sound like glory. Peter to the rescue. Peter confidently proclaimed that there is no reason that, should, that that should ever have to happen. Peter was confident, but Peter hadn't quite worked out his theology. His faith was immature. So being proud about Jesus also means having a solid foundation of who he is, what he did for us, and how it impacts his followers' relationship with the world that doesn't know him. You see, we, Christ's followers, we should desire with all of our hearts for others to know him. Because as Kathy Lee Gifford said this week when she was talking about Billy Graham's passing and in regards to her own faith in Jesus, she said, if you had the cure for cancer, would you, would you keep it quiet? Or would you hold it and keep it secret? Because I always say that I have the cure for the malignancy of the soul and he has a name. His name is Jesus. I'm reminded of the time when Jesus said, Come to me all that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you 
and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus calms the soul like nothing else in this world. We should be proud of our Lord. We should want to share Jesus with the world. But we also have to recognize that our desire to share Christ's love with the world should not make us lose our wits about how we ought to do that. I want to share some insight into my own personal bias regarding how I've witnessed what I believe is a a misuse of these words by Jesus. When he encourages his followers not to be ashamed of him and his words. Building on that idea that there's some bad theology that can guide us sometimes. You see, when I've heard these words echoed from others throughout my life. It's often from people whose approach to evangelism is one that is very low in investment. And their responsibility to a personal relationship to the person to whom they're evangelizing. An approach that is often called billboard theology. Have you ever seen a billboard for Jesus? Have you ever seen them? You're in the South. I'm sure you've seen at least one. When you die, are you going to heaven or hell? Call 1-800-JESUS. Hell is, of course, written in large red letters with fire surrounding it. That's kind of the same idea When people walk up to strangers with pamphlets describing in detail, bullet point, how to accept Jesus as your Savior and ensure you're not going to hell. Those pamphlets probably weren't written by the person handing them out, but hey, they've done their job, right? Sometimes you see it on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, even today. Share this picture if you're not ashamed of Jesus. I'm critical of this approach, and I think anybody who understands Jesus' words should be. Billboard theology is doing far more harm for the mission of Jesus Christ than it is good. The generations of Americans who are turning away from the church are turning away from the church because of billboard theology. They're turning away because all that they see from followers of Christ is people who want to have very little responsibility to engage in a long-term relationship. We're looking way too often for quick fixes to people's souls. People who are turning away from the church, they do not see love in the face of a billboard with big red letters and fire coming out of it. They don't feel love by Joe Schmo who walks up and the first thing out of his mouth is, do you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? People don't feel loved by that approach. What do you think they feel? judgment. That's not the way Christ came. People whose theology requires them to use this kind of approach have little to no understanding who Jesus is and what his teachings are all about. So I think that we should be encouraged to know that what is broken in America and the world today can be fixed. But not without some hard work and following the long path that is not about quick fixes. 
And really, when you think about it, that's exactly what the season of Lent is all about. Isn't it? It's about knowing the Via Dolorosa, the road that Jesus walked to Golgotha with a cross on his back, to the place where he would die. It's about knowing and understanding that that is a very, 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 very long road. If any of us want to know Jesus, we should spend a long time on that road with him. Because when Jesus is encouraging his disciples to be about his words and his teachings, he is inviting us to walk that long road with him. He's inviting us to remember the kind of love that is seen in the Good Samaritan on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jesus is calling us to remember the parable of the prodigal son and the wideness of the Father's mercy and forgiveness. He is inviting us to remember that when asked by Pilate to defend himself, said nothing. Yet chose to carry a cross to the place where he would die a vicious death. If any wants to have pride about Jesus and his words, Show him that you are willing to invest in a stranger in the same way that the Good Samaritan chose to, even though he was on a journey of his own. If any want to show that you're not ashamed of Christ, put no limit on how many times that you choose to forgive someone, no matter how hurt you are. Offer to the world, the kind of forgiveness and mercy that the father of the prodigal son showed. If anyone wants to have pride about Jesus and his words, show him that you understand how long that journey to the cross actually is. That's what it means to be proud of Jesus and his teachings. In the book of Acts, you see the ministry for which our Lord was preparing his disciples. And in his disciples, and even Peter, you see the confidence that they had to continue his ministry. His disciples continued his ministry. They healed the sick. They cured the blind. They cast out demons. Folks, that's the kind of work that we are to be about today. We've got to find, again, that holy pride that makes us willing to walk that long road to go to Golgotha with Jesus so that we might find the strength to be empowered by the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ to be who we are called to be. To do what we are called to do. And that is not a light mission. He is calling us to be people who are in it for the long haul. People who love other people so hard and love Jesus so hard that other people cannot help but see Jesus in our faces. And I hope today that we can all look upon our Lord with great pride. That tough guy right there carrying that cross That's my Lord, Jesus, the Christ, 
join me in a word of prayer. Holy and loving Father, help us to understand your teachings deep in our souls. God, give us pride for the work that you call us to do. And Lord, we are, we are so proud to call ourselves your followers. Help us to find the cross that you are calling us to pick up and help us to carry it with confidence so that others might know how great your love for this world is. It is in Jesus Christ's holy name that we pray. Amen. Our invitation this morning is for each of us here to find in the calling of Christ a greater responsibility, to be willing to invest in the lives of others for the long haul. May we all commit this morning to walking the Via Dolorosa with our Lord without shame. Let us make that commitment as we stand and sing our hymn of commitment, number 134, Jesus Paid It All. Stand together and sing. By the God of hope, love, and peace. And may we take that blessing out into the world that we too might become a blessing to others.